So per Bloomberg, Rupert Murdoch is now testifying that Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was potentially given some inside information during the 2020 election. And you won't believe what Tucker Carlson had to say about Donald Trump based on new information revealed in the Dominion lawsuit. Apparently, Rupert Murdoch is, uh, quote unquote, friends with Jared Kushner. And basically, as debates approached, uh, or debates passed, or Biden's team submitted ads in the 2020 election, Rupert Murdoch would kind of give Jared Kushner a little bit of uh, friendly advice, like, hey, don't be too much of a bully on Biden. Hey, this is what the Biden ads are going to look like going forward. Uh, now, keep in mind, Dominion is the Dominion voting machines company. Dominion is actually suing uh, the uh, Fox Corporation. Rupert Murdoch is the owner of that. Uh, he was actually seen at the Super Bowl with Elon Musk. They were sort of in the box together. But anyway, along with Rupert Murdoch's wife, uh, apparently Fox is being sued for potentially amplifying the conspiracy theory related to the rigging or stealing of the election. Dominion is claiming defamation, saying that a lot of districts have now canceled the use of Dominion voting machines and that their money, or their income has basically been negatively impacted because of the work of Fox News, despite overwhelming evidence that the election was not rigged and there wasn't a fraud. If, if you were, watched me back in 2020, you remember I actually covered this quite well, uh, in my opinion, quite well, uh, quite a lot, I should say, more generically. But, uh, you know, what I covered, for example, the Georgia phone call with Donald Trump, which Donald Trump suggested was uh, a perfect phone call. It was not a perfect phone call, okay? It was really clear that Donald Trump was basically begging to, quote-unquote, find just an extra 12,000 votes. That's all he needed was 12,000 votes, right? Uh, and, and the pressure was pretty pretty blunt and pretty obvious. It was actually a really interesting phone call to cover. You could probably still find it on YouTube if it's not censored. Meet Kevin, uh, Donald Trump, Georgia phone call, something like that. But anyway... What's interesting is you're getting a lot of these quotes coming out, uh, like Sean Hannity calling Sidney Powell and her theories uh, about the election uh, uh, basically crazy, calling her, quote, an effing lunatic. Dan Perino, uh, sorry, Dana Perino uh, is saying that uh, these, these election theories are total BS, insane, and nonsense. Sean Hannity saying you have to be careful, though. You don't want to, quote, unquote, piss off the base. That's actually something that I fail, I feel like, a lot of on, on, on Twitter, is I feel like my, my the people who watch me are very much in the middle, right? Like the 80% of people in the middle. But I do worry because the people on the far left and far right get pissed off when I try when I cover, you know, things I think matter to, to the middle. Uh, and uh, sorry about that, but I think it's important. And, and that's probably the curse of being in the middle. But anyway, there's a trial set for April here. And what's actually very interesting is information that's that's coming out that just came out last night was the following. Two months after the election and just days before January 6th, this is before January 6th, uh, Fox News host Tucker Carlson texted with an unknown Fox employee about how badly he wanted to stop covering Trump, saying, quote, we are very, very close to being able to ignore Trump most nights. Carlson texted on Jan 4th. I truly can't wait. I hate him passionately, Carlson added. Now, that's actually really interesting. Because Tucker Carlson has regularly been seen as as basically like this this extreme uh, fringe uh, uh, by 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 especially people on the left, and I actually a couple of years ago made videos on Tucker Carlson saying, dude, like some of the stuff you're saying about like the CARES Act or the stimulus programs or whatever is just wrong. And, and I was really confused as to why why a, a narratives were really spun in one direction. I actually think, I have to say, I think he's kind of come back or, or his, his department or whatever have come a little bit more towards the middle from, from the fringes. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if anybody agrees with that, but that's sort of a thesis that I have. Apparently, a producer uh, who works with uh, Tucker Carlson also wrote the following, quote, Dominion machines were used in Ohio and Florida. Trump won those states. Did they forget to rig those machines or was that all part of the plan? Uh, and then, of course, Tucker has also complained about this idea that people actually believe this election rigging stuff and this is bad for the country in fact these are his quotes that the election rigging is quote bad for the country to have this much doubt and suspicion this is exactly why people believe in conspiracies we need some sort of audit to settle it to the extent that it can be settled 
Now, remember, defamation would re really require proof of malice by the Fox News company. Uh, and as long as there is some kind of belief that people within Fox actually believed, at least to some degree, some of the election fraud stuff they were covering, it'll be very hard for a Dominion lawsuits to actually, in my opinion, win a defamation lawsuit against a news company uh, organization. Unless, of course, it can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, although this is civil, so it doesn't it doesn't go to the level of reasonable doubt. You just have to get to the preponderance of evidence. But anyway, if you could get enough evidence to say that Fox knew the election rigging story was fake, yet they were still covering as if it was true, Dominion could actually win. But that's sort of the burden they face in a civil case. So that trial is in April, and that trial should be extremely interesting, especially since Rupert Murdoch went as far as saying that if... Uh, the election was overturned, the 2020 election was overturned, we would see riots like we have never seen before. So it's almost kind of like the owner of Fox News knew that covering uh, the election and potentially leading to an overturning could lead to basically like almost a near collapse of democracy is sort of what he was implying. I thought that was that was pretty, uh, pretty remarkable. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. Someone here writes, Carlson will put anything in his mouth so long as it makes him money. I mean, I do think there's there's an element of, of reputation that's very important too, right? I mean, if you say something that's wrong, I, I think most people are reasonable and you kind of want to sort of align back to the truth because if you keep getting exposed as being wrong, then then eventually people can't trust what you're saying anymore uh, and that becomes uh, an even larger issue, <laughs> right? So I, anyway, I think this is interesting because I have to say his coverage, Tucker Carlson's coverage of what's been going on of uh, sort of with with uh, Jan Six has been interesting and enlightening. You know, I, I imagine some of it uh, of the Jan Six footage is is potentially picked uh, in you know, and, and certain things are shown and certain things aren't. I mean, that's just journalism and media. Same thing as like the Twitter files. You know, I would expect that in the Twitter files, like we only see the juicy stuff, not necessarily everything that's act was actually going on at Twitter, right? But that's okay. Okay, because sometimes that juicy stuff alone could be all we need to be like, wait a minute, this is a little sus. Uh, and so I do think, I mean, if you probably saw my Tucker Carlson coverage yesterday, I actually went a step further. And when it came to that quote unquote QAnon shaman, I actually picked up the uh, indictment and the allegations of fact for why the QAnon shaman was sentenced to 41 months in jail. That's actually not something from Fox or from any mainstream media. I just thought, hey, look, if he went to jail, I can pull up the Justice Department files on that. So that's what I did. And when I covered that yesterday, I actually did find something very strange that it seems like, yes, he shouldn't have been on the Capitol grounds. I said that in my video yesterday. The QAnon shaman should not have been on the Capitol grounds. I agree. But that, in my opinion, being on the Capitol grounds does not justify a 41-month sentence. Now, violent entry into the Capitol, that might. But the Justice Department's documents say, oh, the QAnon shaman was charged essentially with violent entry. But in the actual document, it shows he just walked into the building. And I'm like, that's not really consistent with what seems righteous. Right? I don't really care if you're on the left or the right. I agree with you. You shouldn't have been on the inside the Capitol building, right? I, I feel like I can agree with most Americans on that. But to say he violently entered when in the same Justice Department complaint you're saying he didn't seems a little odd. Now, another thing that is also very interesting uh, is, the, is this the piece. The first breach occurred was near where the members of Congress would be locked in. Hold on. We let, me, let me actually back up just a little bit more because I think just two minutes of this is interesting, and then we'll move back into some finance tops. But anyway, take a look at this. If anyone was, Tark Johnson was. Here's more of our sit-down interview with him. Mr. Johnson, thank you for joining us. And thank you for having me. So from the outside, here's how it looked. We now know that huge parts of the federal government were aware that there was going to be something big happening at the Capitol on January 6th. They knew there were going to be big demonstrations there. Um, and they prepared for that. But the Capitol Police, on which you served for 22 years, did not seem prepared at all. And, of course, that would be the front line in preparedness. Was the Capitol Police prepared for that day? The frontline officers and uh, supervisors were not prepared for that at all. I, by the way, completely agree with that. Remember, I covered the election uh, or sort of the, the riots, rather, on Jan 6 for 10 hours that day. And I was blown away with how unprepared the Capitol Police was. When you say it all, did you, you, so you had no idea it was coming? 
Uh, we knew that there was going to be a demonstration that day, but we had no idea that we were going to be facing what we faced on that actual day. So things start to fall apart. People stream in the building. You call upwards in the command chain. Help me. You don't get a response. What do you do next? So around two o'clock, um, it may have been a little bit after two o'clock. I hear a officer say that the Capitol was breached. So I ran inside of the building. I ran, you know, to, to, to assist. I knew that, um, that location of where the, that first breach occurred was near where the members of Congress would be locked in. We initiated a. Now, now that's also really important. Now, while this is not the officer who shot Ashley Babbitt, it's worth noting that through what we're hearing from this Capitol Police officer, we know that the Capitol Police know where the congressmen and women are holed up, basically. And it's basically, in the case of Ashley Babbitt, one person with, or one or two people potentially with a firearm versus, you know, an unknown number of people with an unknown uh, weapons cache, so to speak. And now we ended up finding out that basically none of the rioters were actually armed. Some people were silly and walked into the Capitol with like zip ties and, and bulletproof vests. But, but at, at least from the extent of coverage we could see, nobody actually had weapons. We know that now in hindsight, right? But if you're one officer standing in front of what appears to be a mob breaking down your door uh, and, and you're tasked with protecting congressmen and women who are holed up in, in a room, a door right behind you, you know, it, it sets up a really difficult moment because it's like now do you have to potentially take somebody's life to send the signal like that is the line that you don't cross. And uh, it's, it, it, you know, obviously we, we can never know what it's like to have been in that exact mo situation because, you know, Ashley Babbitt was somebody who was. The Air Force, uh, uh, somebody who, you know, it's, it's, it's one person, uh, one woman compared to, to, to a man. And, and there are arguments on, made on both sides about, like, should, should her life have been taken? You know, I'm not going to go into to depth on that because it's really a different video topic. But I find it's very, very interesting when this particular officer says, we, like, the area that was breached was basically where everybody was hiding. And, and the level of fear there combined with the lack of preparation – is a disaster. That's probably the real issue, in my opinion, is it comes down to if, if the Capitol had properly prepared for this, maybe that severe loss of life that happened, uh, not only at the actual riot with one person being uh, basically trampled, one person being shot, uh, but then multiple people afterwards either committing suicide or having heart attacks, uh, maybe a lot of that could have been prevented. So I think the preparation was a disaster. I think that's really where the finger gets pointed. Anyway, let's keep listening. Lockdown, so that means the chamber doors on the Senate side and the House side were locked. So that means the members of Congress would be safe inside that, those locked rooms. Yes. So I ran over to the um, House side first to make sure that those doors were locked. Then I ran over to the Senate side to make sure that those doors were locked. So I asked over the radio and I say something to the effect that um, we need direction. We have hundreds of people inside of the building. What do you want us to do? We need some direction. I got I, I heard no response. No response. So, you know, um, at that particular time, how, how could nobody respond? Nobody responded. At some point you put on a MAGA hat. Yes. Now, um, I, th I think we have it. I think we have the actual MAGA yes, hat. Yes, we actually do have the MAGA hat. I have it here in plastic. So here it is. Um, I'm going to take <laughs> J6, it <laughs> yes. says. Yeah, so, I labeled it J6. So tell us why you put the hat on and how that was related to your well, suspension that's what got me national attention was the wearing of the mega hat they were officers that we had a distress call that there were um approximately 10 or 11 officers i can't remember the exact number were trapped at the top of the rotunda steps so um i elicited the help of some cdu officers to help me go up the steps and i kept yelling that all the way up the steps giving people high fives trying to make it up the steps to get to the guys and as i was going down there was a um, demonstrator on, I believe he was on my right side of me, so he reached over. I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know if he was going to hit me, and he put the mega hat on my head. So, um, so as I was still trying to walk down the steps, then he asked for the hat back, and I said, well, I would like to keep it because, I, it's, it's, you know, the hat's going to help me. It's your passport through the crowd. Yeah, exactly. So the Capitol Police is by definition nonpartisan. It serves both parties in the Congress. It protects members of both parties. 100%. And it has to be that way. In the wake of January 6th, you saw 
what looked like partisanship at the cap so i'm just going to summarize the rest here out of respect for your time basically this officer was not interviewed by the january 6th committee and tucker carlson's like wait a minute like why is there partisanship why why didn't you get interviewed blah 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 blah. okay fine so look bottom line out of all of this jan 6 was a complete effing disaster that officer is freaking brilliant for putting on a maga hat basically because as tucker said it's like his passport through the crowd to not to, to basically not potentially get killed i mean he doesn't know what he's up against i mean this hasn't happened before there's no precedent for this like if you're a cop and your job is to protect a building and all of a sudden there are you know 500 people uh inside of your building and thousands of people outside of your building and, and windows are being broken and and you know congressmen and women are putting on evacuation hoods and hiding under desks you know it, it, it makes for a little bit of a stressful day i think we can all agree with that uh but anyway some of this i i think it's very interesting very interesting insights. I, I'm fascinated to see what's going to happen with the uh, April Dominion lawsuit. So we'll pay attention to that. Uh, we will also, as more information comes out or whatever we can learn, we'll touch on uh, J6. Mostly because it's, it, it, for me, it was such an impactful day. And uh, I, I'm, I feel very conflicted uh, because I, I personally, you know, when I covered the J6 uh, riots on the day it occurred... I felt uh, very offended, right? I, I thought this was sort of an attack on, on America, on our institutions. But then again, you know, I saw it through the coverage that I was able to see on Twitter and the mainstream media. And now seeing at least some of the perspectives of officers from the inside or footage from the inside, I, I'm kind of, I've catch myself feeling confused. So, uh, you know, by no means do I want anybody to think that, I, you know, I'm, I'm like a MAGA apologist here or on the other hand, you know, I'm calling this for sure like, oh, my God, it's the insurrection. You know, like I'm, I'm not trying to take a stance there. I'm trying to cover sort of in the middle here. It, it just it feels conflicting. Right. And it just it makes me feel more jaded towards both the media and the government. And, and I, I feel sad about that because I don't want to be more jaded. But anyway, uh, so let's move on. So now we're going to talk about, does the recession even matter? Does the recession even matter? Now, I think this is actually a particularly interesting piece. It's a little, it's on the shorter side, but we'll do some commentary on it. Stand by for the piece.